The London system was played in almost 100 million games and today I'm gonna share with you 5 effective ways to completely disarm it. Here's the first way and it's one of my favorite ones. So let's say your opponent goes for d4 and after that plays bishop f4. What do you do next? Well the good news is forewarned is forearmed. We do know what your opponent is going to do. They're gonna put this pyramid of pawns in the middle of the board, play knight of 3 and develop their pieces after that. Knowing this we can disrupt the system and the first way is to play bishop g4. Why? Because it prevents one of the next moves that your opponents were going to play, which is either pawn e3 or knight to f3. Now, fun fact is, quite a lot of your opponents will still play pawn e3, which, I mean, in this case is just a straightforward blunder of their queen in one move, and yet, like, it's the third most played move in this position. Now, what else can they do? By the way, the fun thing is, I've tried this bishop g4 move in over the board games as well. And it's really funny to see the reaction, because so far your opponent was confident playing these first moves d4, bishop f4, having a clear plan of what they're going to do. But as soon as you bring the bishop out, it disrupts the plan, and their reaction is like, oh, and they start thinking, because they were planning to just put up this system that they do know so well, and now it just doesn't work any longer. So, what can they do? They can try a knight of 3, just hoping to play e3 on the next move. But as soon as the knight is here, you can trade it off and double their pawns. So after that, it's pretty simple. You just develop your pieces normally, casually, knight of 6, you know, after whatever it is that they do, you play e6, and then bishop d6, you castle, you play c5, knight to c6, all standard development moves, and you've got a great position. But the good thing about all this thing is that we completely disrupted their London system. Now it's a completely new game, different position, unfamiliar for your opponent, and black is totally fine. Some of your opponents will try to get rid of this bishop by going pawn to h3, but you just drop it one square back and nothing changes. If they want to keep pursuing the bishop and going for pawn to g4, there is no danger for the bishop, it can always go back. But now, this is a permanent weakness, this g4 pawn. Which means that they can hardly castle in this game king side, that would be extremely dangerous, their king will be exposed. Moreover, you can always challenge this weakness by going pawn h5 and your rook is gonna be involved. So overall, I mean, of course the game goes on, but you've got a great position and again you disrupted the London system right out of the gate. On the next moves, still the same, knight of 6, e6, bishop d6, just normal development and you're good to go. The second system is slightly similar, but in this case we do want to bring our bishop out to f5. You don't have to do it right away, you can first play knight f6, but as soon as they're ready to put their bishop to this active position, we know that they're going to do this and we prevent this by going bishop f5 first, taking control over this diagonal. Now that bishop on d3 normally plays a key role in their potential middle game attack of your castling, therefore you just stop it. Moreover, here's a pro tip. If they ever play bishop d3 anyway, just hoping for you to trade, what do you do? You stay strong, right? You're part of the your nation, the nation of domination. And you know that to take is a mistake. So you don't do this. Now, your bishop is already defended, so you don't have to worry about this. You can just play your own moves, bishop d6 and, you know, castle, all the standard stuff. Now, if they try trading off everything, and if they trade on f5 as well, well, good for you. Now you have a complete control over the square e4, and it's a really handy square for your knight to be landed in the future. And after that, again, you castle, you just finalize your development, you've got a great position, nothing to worry about. There is also one funny trap here. Sometimes your opponents see that their London system is not gonna work out because you do control this square already, and they decided to switch back to the Queen's Gambit kind of stuff. And so they play c4, just hoping to play knight to c3 and switch it back to usual Queen's Gambit ideas. However, there is an interesting opportunity that you can take advantage of. Now, this diagonal is kind of weak. And you can first trade off the knight so that it can't go to c3. So you trade off the knight. And after that, you go bishop b4 check. And all of a sudden, there is no convenient way for them to cover their king. Because normally, they would love to have their bishop on c1 and play bishop d2, but the bishop is not there. They would love to have their knight on b1 so that it can jump forward, but it's not there. And therefore, if they try knight f3 going back to d2, then the knight is pinned and actually after knight e4 you just win the knight on the next move with a completely winning position. The third system is somewhat similar to the second one, but you keep the position completely dry. You also trade pawns in the middle of the board. So your idea is still to put the bishop out to f5, but you don't hurry to play this. You first play c5. At this point they normally play their typical London system move pawn e3. Then you trade in the center. So you want to keep the position completely dry, where they have no attacking ideas whatsoever. And generally speaking, you do want to bring the bishop out as soon as they're ready to play bishop d3 themselves, right? But right now you can start off by going knight c6, which takes aim at this pawn, 
Therefore, they can't play bishop d3 or else the pawn will be lost. So they have to defend it somehow, let's say, by going pawn to c3. And then you bring the bishop out to f5 so they can't put their bishop to an active square. And after that, you just develop. Again, nothing special. So they'll probably play something like this. You do also just standard development moves. Probably they will play bishop d3 at some point, then you trade it off. Here I would not recommend that you allow them to trade off here, because now those pawns will be a little bit weak, as well as your king. So better to trade off, just simpler. Then you can play bishop d6 and trade off this bishop as well. And as you can see, you would just, you know, trade it off most of the pieces. After that, your castle position becomes completely dry and drawish. However, like, back in the day, I usually avoided these kind of positions. I thought that they were boring to play and, like... Maybe it's strawish, I don't want to play it. But then I had a great coach, uh, Grandmaster Malanuk, and he told me one interesting thing, that when your opponent doesn't have an idea of how to attack you, they start doing weird, wrong things, and you win effortlessly, just because they lose the game on their own. They start going forward, recklessly weakening their position, blundering away pieces, and you win. And when I tried it out, it really works. <laughs> so, uh, you can play this position for a win, Definitely, because your opponents are clueless. There is no attack against you. They have to play positionally. They have no idea how to do this, and they play bad moves and lose. Now, of course, you do need to know how to play positionally, right? So if you don't feel comfortable playing these type of positions with maneuvering and positional play, I've got a free masterclass where I teach you all the fundamentals about this so that you feel absolutely confident playing these strategic chess, and I'll drop a link below in the description. You can check it out after watching this video. The next system is probably the most aggressive approach against the London system. We're not gonna just counter it, we're gonna counter attack and right from the beginning. We're gonna counter attack on the third move. So you play an out of six and then you play c5 because that challenges the center and gives way for your queen. And after they defend this pawn however they like it, c3 or e3, doesn't matter, you bring the queen out to b6. Now here we capitalize on the fact that due to the absence of bishop on c1, which used to defend this pawn, it's not guarded anymore. And we wanna make use of that. Plus we put pressure also indirectly towards this pawn on d4. That already kind of confuses your pawn a little bit, because of course there are different ways for him to defend this pawn, but they all look a little bit awkward, because what can they do? If they ever play b3, you know, this weakens this pawn and like this diagonal, potentially this diagonal, and it's not what they really want to do. After that, if they ever play this, there's a very simple system that you can use. You can go d6 and then develop your bishop to g7, we're kind of trying to capitalize on these long-term weaknesses. And then you castle, go, you know, play standard chess, knight c6, etc. Et and you've got a good position. And again, their position is weakened and you got them out of what they're used to do. So now they're also clueless, they don't know what to do, and you have a good position objectively. There is also a nice trap that's possible here. Sometimes they do play queen to c2. And after that, you can trade on d4, but don't take this pawn on d4. That would be a blunder. You would blunder this bishop on c8 with a checkmate. So instead, just play knight c6, adding one more attack. And after they play e3, go d6, preparing for e5. That's another interesting way to start your counterattack by going e5. They don't expect this, because normally in the queen's gambit, you've got your pawn on d5, so you don't have those e5 ideas. But here you do have it. And they play knight of three, thinking that it prevents you from playing so. But you do play e5 right away. Anyway, so they trade, and now they start counting, and they see that they've got two attackers against one defender, so they think that you miscalculated, and they happily capture it. So their way of calculating is, you take, I take, I'm up a pull. But we've got something prepared. So instead you play queen a5, which is a double attack to the king and the knight, and now we're going to grab the knight on the next move and just win it. Now, at this point, they play queen c3, offering an exchange of queens and thinking that they're still good and that they're also guarding this knight on e5. But we still have another unpleasant surprise, bishop b4, skewing the queen and winning it on the next move. There is also one important safety measure, so to say, especially when you encounter a more prepared opponent. Sometimes what they do here after you play queen b6, they don't want to play passive moves such as queen c1 or b3, they do play knight c3. Gambiting this pawn on b2, because after that, they sometimes hope to go for knight b5 and, you know, start all kinds of counter-attacking things against your queen and forks. And if you don't know how to play it, you're going to be in trouble. I mean, objectively, it's okay, but you got to know some theory here. So here's what I do recommend. Let's take it back. If you see this move knight to c3, just don't take the pawn right away. It's very simple, right? You don't have to do it. You've got this threat and it will always be unpleasant for your opponent. You can just continue putting up your system. You're kind of like playing the dragon Sicilian, so to say. 
right? And after that, you can still play g6, bishop g7, castle. You know, sooner or later, your opponent will still have to guard this pawn and play one of those awkward defending moves such as rook b1 or b3. So your queen will always be in a useful position, but you'd avoid any kind of issues, any troubles, and you don't have to know any theory here. I've got a dedicated video about this particular system against the London system, therefore if you like this counter-attacking style, I'll drop a link below in the description and you can check it out later. And here's the next setup against the London system, it is very solid, it is used by a lot of grandmasters, you have everything covered, you have very harmonious position of your pieces, and your opponent has no attacking ideas whatsoever. Now, this is not a specific position, of course, I'm just showing you how to develop pieces when you're playing black. And now we're gonna go move by move, and I'll show you all the details of exactly how to do it in the best way possible, but for now you can just see how harmonious your pieces are. So first off, with this battery, you completely take over this diagonal, therefore your opponent can never attack you there, can never land their knight on e5 or anything like that. You have your two bishops standing here on these nice diagonals, you have no weaknesses, you can push e5 yourself in the future if you want to, or you can land your knight right here, like everything is just great. Now let's go back and I'll show you exactly how to get to this position. Initially you play standard development moves, after that you play e6 followed by bishop d6. Now, you challenge this bishop, if they trade on d6, good, you just recapture with your queen, no problem. In most cases, they drop the bishop back to g3. When this happens, you do not want to take there. I mean, there's nothing really bad there, but if you trade off, that opens up this rook from h1, and it gives white some potential attacking ideas, so we don't want to do this, and we don't take there. Instead, you just continue your plan. You play c5, attacking the center. They usually go c3. Now, as part of your plan, you'd wish to go knight to d7. But you can't do it right away, that would block out the queen. So if you play knight to d7, that would drop the bishop on d6, and that would be a big blunder. So you don't do this. Instead, you first play queen to c7, just putting up this battery along this diagonal. After that, they play something, let's say bishop d3, and now you play knight to d7. Now, here's the good thing. You take control of this square e5. Why is that? Why is it important? Well, because in the middle game, in most of the cases, if Y wants to be active here in the London system, they want to play knight e5 and then maybe a 4 or something like this, so that's their way to start going forward and attacking you. But now with this battery you make it impossible because you have too many attacks against the square. So if they go with their knight there, you just take it and you win a pawn at the end of this exchange. Therefore they can't do it. And without this knight e5 idea, basically they have nothing else to do, they have no attacking ideas. As soon as they castle, you can, if you want, trade on g3. Why? Because their rook is no longer on h1. Therefore, you don't open any file for their rook. So as soon as they castle, you can trade it off. And then you continue your plan with b6 and bishop b7. So let's say they go knight e2, you play bishop b7. They play whatever, you castle. And you have this great position. What are you going to do then in the middle game after they play whatever? a4 or rook e1, like whatever. You've got two basic ideas here. Uh, one of them is to play knight e4, because maybe they wanted to play e4 themselves. I mean, it's not dangerous at all, that would just lead to massive exchange of everything and a drawish position, but anyway, you can play knight e4 and shut it down, and now they're kind of clueless of what to do at all, because they can hardly move. And your knight is supported, therefore life's good. So that's one idea, maybe you can play f5 over protect the knight, and then you're kind of dominating already. Now, besides knight e4, the second idea is to play e5 yourself. That's why it's so handy for us to have our queen here and our knight here, which control the square. After break open the center with e5, usually your position actually becomes slightly superior. Because, of course, like, it's more or less equal. Uh, but now you have a little bit more space. So it's kind of white now who's trying to fight for a draw for equality. Because you've got more space, you can put your rooks in the middle of the board, you can play an ID4. You know, life's good with very simple moves. So now white has to be careful. They have to defend and fight for a draw. And of course, it's not the outcome that white was hoping for out of the opening. I'm curious to know which system do you love the most, and if you want me to create any other anti-some opening videos, then let me know which openings you want me to cover and counter. Uh, finally, all the resources I mentioned will be in the description below, the free masterclass sold there, the video with one of these systems is right there. Thank you very much for watching, and if you're a London system player, I'm sorry.